So now we'll we'll change we'll change the settings. We're still going to be handling volcanic eruptions, of course. But one thing I would like to uh, we're going to use the same kind of arguments that I've been using before, simple arguments, and then we'll back them up with uh, with equations if need be. But so we'll start with this. This is mostly going to be driven by observations. And uh, one thing that I think has been uh, uh, neglected in the behavior of a volcano is the buildup of a volcanic edifice. It's not a buildup of a lava flow. It's a buildup of an edifice. A volcanic edifice like this one, this is Mount Adams. Mount Adams ra rises something like two kilometers above uh, the original first surface before the volcanic activity is erupted in that area. It's a beautiful volcano. It's ex 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 extinct, ex extinct now. But it's linked to uh, Mount Sutanens and other volcanoes. It's been heavily studied. And it shows very interesting features. Though it's extinct for, it's been extinct for uh, about 100,000 years, if I remember correctly. One thing we, uh, we have to remember uh, this is a typical uh, magma differentiation series. For those of you who are not petrologists, uh, these, these are a series of lavas that are simply uh, produced from one another by fractional crystallization. You start with basalt. You crystallize it. When you crystallize it, you have dense mafic cumulates. These usually will settle to the base of a reservoir, will generate uh, an, what we will call an evolved lava, this andesite might also crystallize, settle some heavy minerals. Then this will derive dacite and then right. The, no, the ni names are not that important. You can figure out what the differential trend is by looking simply at the concentration of uh, SiO2, silicate oxide. The remarkable thing is that you will find all these lavas in the same volcanic system showing you, of course, that if you have rhyolite, that implies that there was some basalt at some point. And the other thing that's important is that uh, you will find usually basalt at the surface. And the question is, what makes uh, basalt stop somewhere to produce the rhyolite? That's an important feature. Why do eruptions uh, occur at the surface with basalt? And then uh, after some time, you start building up an edifice, and then you have rhyolite. And that's the questions I'm going to ask today in this talk. The other thing that you have to know is that, I'll show that later on, there's a change of viscosity across that compositional range. Basalt are the most fluid lavas, rhyolite are the most viscous lavas. But there's also a change in density. And this is a typical density. You can see that, of course, a basalt is not a single liquid. It's a family of liquids over a certain range of composition. And that's the density range. The important thing is that it goes down as, the, uh, as you go up the differential series. The, most, the more evolved the magma is, the less dense it is, usually. You will notice that I have not accounted for volatiles, and we'll introduce them later on. But I will talk only about dry magmas. Volatiles are an, an important feature, but uh, not for not that important for what I'm going to talk about today. And density has got to be compared with other types of densities. The average cross density, we know that from gravity studies, et cetera, it's about 2.7. So this is telling you something that you would have already known if you had looked at the field, is that the basalts are able to rise through the crust because they are just about the same density, usually slightly less dense. So basalt can make it to the surface. And in many uh, volcanic systems, they do make it to the surface. On the other hand, if you have an old or a continent that are with sedimentary rocks or fractured crystalline rocks, fractured crystalline rocks is rocks filled with uh, fractures of uh, filled with water, so it's less dense. If you have built up a superficial cover, supercrustals, they're usually less dense and they can be uh, uh, as low as 2.35 in density. You can see a basalt will be able to rise through average crust, we will not be able to go through these uh, shallow coastal systems. So you can see that the, t the density difference between magma and surrounding rock may be positive or negative and may change sign during transport simply because you will encounter rocks of different densities. So that's an important feature to, 
Now, if you look at the, sorry. The other thing that you have to know about the volcanic system is that there's a, usually they end up building big volcanic edifices, much thicker than individual lava flows. Shield volcanoes, stratovolcanoes, the shield and stratovolcanoes are different because of their slopes. Shield volcano is a small slope. They derive their name for ancient uh, shields, or if you like uh, Game of Thrones and stuff like that, so that's the shield. Uh, stratovolcanoes, uh, they don't show up in Game of Thrones, but anyway, they are much uh, steeper slopes. That's an old shield volcano on continents. They occur on continent oceans. But you can see how large they are. The radius extends to uh, this particular area to 24 kilometers. Big, big lateral extent. Height now is uh, less than it used to be because it's an old volcano that's been uh, eroded away quite a lot, 800 meters. Mount Adams, radius 10 kilometers. Height uh, about 2.5 kilometers. What I'm going to show is what matters more, more than anything else is the radius, and we'll see why. So these things uh, represent large loads on the surface. The loading has got an effect on the stress distribution. And this is uh, mostly what I'm going to talk about in this uh, lecture. If we look at what happens, look at Mount Adams. It's a photograph. That's a, an ancient volcano. It's, it's dead now. But uh, we can see, uh, the, as time evolved, this volcano changed. Uh, and it changed how? It changed because it started erupting more and more evolved lavas. And uh, the erupted lavas, through some events, became increasingly involved with, evolved with time. So initially, you had basalts coming out of the system. Then you build up an edifice. And eventually, you started to erupt. I'm sorry, you can't see the difference between andesite and dacite. There's a dacite flow here. There's very few dacite flows in that system. But then it started to erupt andesite. I'm sorry, this is in French. So the big translation, if you look at your dictionary, basalt with an E is French, and basalt without an E is English. And andesite with uh, this uh, accent here is French, and andesite without this is English. And dacite, you're fortunate, no difference. Uh, so anyway, so initially you had lots of uh, basaltic lavas coming out, and then you started to erupt andesite and dacite. Of course, if you erupt these evolved lavas, this implies that the reservoir has formed. But why is it that we had basalts coming out? And why is it that the basalts eventually were prevented from coming out and generated evolved lavas? So primitive lavas are always present in the system. But uh, when there is a, a volcanic edifice, they do not erupt centrally. They erupt in peripheral vents, distal vents and fissures. So there's always basalts coming in. But the basalts do not erupt centrally. They erupt away from the axis. That's an observation. Just an example, post-glacial period, which is nicely studied because the glaciers have just uh, uh, eroded the edifice. So you can build up some stratigraphy of that. Uh, there's one summit andesite. So that's an evolved lava. And the Zeiss with high elevation flanks, and also some peripheral basalts. So you can see that if you go from this side, the denser lavas, remember basalts are dense, low altitudes, away from the central system, and then under Zeiss, higher up. And then eventually, there was some dacite right at the top when the, uh, just when the volcanic activity stopped. So it's not something that's only uh, observed at Mount Adams. It's observed in most stratovolcanoes and large continental shield edifices. And Medicine Lake, for example, has got exactly the same kind of features. I will show you other features in other volcanoes that are exactly similar to that. So there's, this is a very specific and reproducible pattern. You can also see that uh, there's rapid changes of magma composition. This is. Uh, Mount St. Helens, basically the average composition of Mount St. Helens is basically day site, close to and the side, day site. And red is the, uh, these evolved lavas, and that's time, year before present, 4,000 years before present, now. And there was a big change, and this occurred several times in the history of this volcano, where you suddenly shifted to another composition and a more primitive composition. So there's Activity that's sustained for quite a while with the same compositions and then abrupt changes. And uh, these abrupt changes in this particular case uh, were eroded by a return to more primitive compositions. 
in the summit area. And so there's a problem of time scales here. Life span of a volcanic system is something like uh, between 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 6 years. Mount St. Helens has been active for about 50,000 years. Mount Adams altogether was active for about uh, 400,000 years. And there's two types of evolution of magma compositions, slow, differential trend toward more and more evolved magmas, and fast, return to primitive compositions. How can we account for, after all, this is the same plumbing system, how can we account for such a marked change in the time scales for lava composition? Well, one thing which I will uh, try to convince you of is that the, the fast thing is simply the, uh, due to the, the fact that an edifice is unstable and might get destroyed by slope failure. These are thick edifices. They are not always at the uh, static angle of repose. So they're not exactly granular piles, but uh, they still have to obey some, uh, some strength uh, relationships. So they can't uh, go to any thickness. And uh, they also are unstable because they are going to be affected by alteration. The rainfall is coming through and changing and uh, alters the rocks. And they, they can also be destroyed by, uh, in, by uh, magma intrusion itself. And this is what happens in Mount St. Helens. There was a big uh, magma intrusion there. And it just uh, destroyed. Uh, you lost about a kilometer of, of uh, edifice. And that's a big change in, in edifice size. And that's rapid. So you, I think you still see what I'm going to drive at. Slow means you build up an edifice. Fast, you destroy it. As you build up the edifice, you build up pressure. Pressure prevents lavas from reaching the surface and pre prevents primitive lavas from reaching the surface. You destroy the edifice. You can erupt primitive lavas again because you just uh, uh, dispense with the load that was applied to the, to the crust. So when there is an edifice, no summit eruptions of basalts, primitive lavas. And at Mount St. Helens, you can check that's observation. What happens there? Well, there was a change, a rapid change, but we know the edifice got destroyed. And there was a big landslide. So failure, that's not clear because that's an old uh, deposit. But we see, uh, we see the edifice was completely destroyed. And we see, of course, the deposits that came out of this edifice direction. And the consequence was that a return, a very fast return to the basaltic primitive lava compositions. That's an observation. And this is, again, not something that's uh, only observed at Mount St. Helens or Mount Adams. It's, it's observed in many other volcanoes, Mount St. Helens, Hawaii, Santorini, and others. So again, this is not something that's specific to uh, one volcano. It's something that is quite uh, general. So what I'm going to uh, go through in this series of lectures is what is the stress field due to loading by an edifice? I'm not going to talk a lot about impatience for dike ascent towards the summit, because that is something that uh, Torsten, Torsten Dam has worked a lot on. So I'm not going to step on his toes. And Eleonora has done some work on that, too. And uh, I'll, do, I'll deal a little bit with implications for lateral magma transport. So again, the, this again plot where we're going to have to worry about is not going to worry too much about viscosity. I will go back to that. A little bit, but not much. You look at this a remarkable uh, increase of viscosity. This is for dry magmas. If you add water, as maybe uh, Michael or others have mentioned, water acts to decrease magma viscosity tremendously. But there is still going to be a general trend of increasing viscosity with increasing differentiation or increasing uh, uh, concentration of silica. Density again. So these are things that we have to worry about. The important physical parameters, we're going to deal a little bit with fracture, not much, because again, Torsten, I think Eleanor will talk a bit about it. I will spend some time on the stress field due to the edifice. This is going to be, this is going to play a big role. And this is, of course, something which I can relate to observations. Again, Mount Adams, this is uh, uh, not imagined. This is the, we know the composition of these lavas. We can figure out what their densities were. You can see the difference in density between all these. 
And then we're going to worry about supply rate a little bit and magma viscosity. And uh, magma dep viscosity depends on uh, on soil temperature and uh, just a, a reminder of that. But we're not going to talk about temperature here today. So the edifice, big load, how deep this effect goes into the crust. Well, uh, what I'm going to show you is that the, the depth extent of the load is determined not by the heights, so as much as the radius. So you can solve for this problem. You were considering an elastic half space. We can discuss this later on. We have a, here it's a cylinder, but I can do a calculation for a cone. It's not a big issue. So you, you, are, you load the surface, and below we have an elastic medium. That can be relaxed in many other cases. Uh, sufficiently deep, you will go into uh, viscoelastic behavior, but I'm going to assume elastic behavior here. And in this particular system, you have to solve for the equation uh, in a cynical coordinate system. You can show that at the axis, uh, the, these are the stress components in a horizontal plane, sigma r, sigma theta. Here is a symmetric uh, tensor. You can show that there's no deviatoric stresses uh, along the of diagonal terms, and the uh, the two uh, diagonal terms are equal to one another, and so that looks like a pressure field. There is no deviatoric stress. So essentially, what you have along the axis is a variation of the local pressure. So you can solve for these, and uh, you can again make things dimensionless. You scale the uh, your pressure perturbation, that sigma v was these diagonal terms that I've shown previously, and you scale this by the edifice load. So the edifice load plays a role. Rho m is the uh, average lava density, the lava that makes up the edifice. H e is the, the height of your edifice. You scale that, and then the depth has got to be scaled by the radius of the edifice. And that's the, uh, the theoretical solution that you get. This involves uh, calculations that are straightforward. I've done using standard techniques. If you like Bessel functions, that's, uh, that's good for you. And so you split. Uh, there's an area under compression down to a depth of about 1.5, the radius of the edifice. And then you're, you have a slight region of tension, and then you go back to zero. So you can see that the edifice impacts the uh, upper crust over a thickness which is about two times the radius of the edifice. If you look at the off-axis distribution, you can solve for the, that's the, uh, this component of velocity, of, uh, of, uh, of stress, which, which is, might not be equal to that if you go away from uh, the axis. So at the axis, you're here at zero. That's the solution corresponding to that plot. Then if you go to a, a radial distance, which is half of the radius, it is not that different. So the stress field is, uh, close to the axis is quite homogeneous, and you have to go to quite large distances away from the axis for the stress field to change uh, in an important way. So stress decreases with increasing depth, of course, increasing distance from the axis, of course, and stress become negligible at the distance of about three times the edifice radius. So you can see that the footprint of the edifice influence is large because that's, that extends to quite a large level. Now, is it important? Well, it's difficult to get constraints on uh, the reservoir depth. And uh, so this is what I was able to get. This is usually done by, uh, by petrology. So you get uh, lavas that erupt. You look at the uh, minerals that have been uh, crystallizing at depths. And depending on the pressure, uh, you uh, you can get uh, different minerals. And then if you study the minerals, you can get pressure. The important thing, I think, is something that's been overlooked, is that what you get is, uh, is the pressure of the reservoir. And to turn the pressure of the reservoir into a depth, you have to assume the pressure in the reservoir is hydrostatic. And this is not always the case. And I could show, if you're interested, I could show you that in many cases, you can show that it's not true. And I've shown you in my previous lecture that you would expect the uh, pressure in the reservoir to change with time and to be not hydrostatic. But anyway, this is the best you can get. Reservoir depths using petrological values for several volcanoes. Sometimes they, they have a large range. 
you're not maybe not surprised. Vesuvius is uh, an important thing. Vesuvius probably is, most eruptions are coming from a shallow system, but there's a deeper connecting system. We know the edifice radius now, so edifice radius kilometers. That's uh, Z equals RE. Z equals three RE. Between that, up to three RE, we know that we we have some influence, but the largest influence will be between these two curves, RE and about two RE here. And you can see that most of those systems will be affected by the stress induced by the edifice. Mount Spur has a very deep reservoir, obviously, but there's a shallow system. And that's, of course, the shallow system that uh, Pinatubo, that was a famous eruption. That was the second, second largest eruption in the 20th century. And it's clearly a shallow. The other thing that's important, I think, is that it's well known that uh, most active magma reservoirs are at shallow coastal depths. And uh, there's, a, there's been a lot of discussions about why is that so. And I think I will, uh, I hope to be able to convince you that it's mostly uh, something which is due to the edifice. So magma ascend between beneath an edifice. So we're now going to relax some of our assumptions and look a little bit. We know that still we have magma buoyancy and overpressure. This is something which we saw in the previous lecture. The overpressure might come from the reservoir or deep reservoir. But the one thing that I would like to uh, now worry is, is that, of course, ascent is possible only if the conduit remains open. So magma must be over pressured with respect to the surroundings. If it's under pressure, then the conduit is not going to be stable. If it's an open fracture, you can open up a fracture by over pressure. That's called hydraulic fracturing. And I think Torsten and Eleanor will talk a lot about that. If I had hydraulic fractures, because the magma is overpressured and breaks up the rock under its own pressure. If it's not overpressured, then of course it can't break up the rock and it can't rise. So let's look at hydrostatics. Remember, hydrostatics are a very powerful way. Now we just look at magma overpressure within a static dike. Now I have two, two slopes here. We start with the reservoir, and that's uh, the pressure difference with respect to the lithostatic pressure in the country rock. So we might be slightly off, but then uh, that's, the, uh, that's a vertical thing because uh, above this, I have only rock with density rho c. Now, if like magma is at density rho equals rho c, you can see that I have no problem. I remain overpressured and I have the same overpressure that uh, I have in the magma reservoir. Now, if I've got buoyant magma, if rho m is less than rho c, this is the pressure inside my magma column. And the overpressure is the pressure within the dike or the fracture minus the pressure of the host rock. And you can see that it increases and increases with, uh, as you go near the surface. That's important. You can see that in the, under those conditions, you would expect, indeed, the lava to be able to break up uh, the rocks and reach the surface without any problem. Now, you add the stress due to edifice load. Now, now I'm still referring everything to the lithostatic pressure field. Now, I'm adding my stress distribution to the edifice. You remember that curve? And then you can see that depending on the magma density, you have different situations. If there's a very low density, again, the magma is always over pressure. Now, the, the relevant stress field is this one, because we have the edifice effect. So low density, no problem. I'm over pressured. I reach the surface. At this particular level, I'm just about right because I'm still over pressured by the time I reach the surface. But now, for this particular case, you can see that the magma density is, is too big, and uh, I end up being under pressured, and therefore eruption is unlikely under these conditions. So we can define a critical uh, density threshold, which separates two different cases. Magmas that are less dense than this critical density will be able to erupt. Magmas that are denser than this particular threshold will not be able to erupt. That's a simplified version of uh, what happens. You can, you, you can do more complicated things, but it's a basic story. And you can now get a diagram. I've assumed a, a reservoir at, with some of the pressure that's starting depths. It is not very essential. You have to assume that for these calculations, but you can change that slightly. It's not going to change the basic story. And you can separate, therefore, on the basis of these simple arguments, simply based on hydrostatics. You can separate two different fields, one in which the magma will be able to erupt, and the other field in which magma will not be able to erupt and will get stored. And so that's magma density. And 
edificite. What I would like you to notice is that these calculations are done just as a function of density without paying attention to what are the densities of true lavas and without attention to the true edifice heights that are observed in nature. But in the end, you can see that we are just within the domain that we see in the field. These are edifice heights that we see in the field. And this is the density difference that we also see in the, these uh, volcanic systems. You go from basalt to rhyolite here. So the story is that, of course, if you have a zero edifice height, in this particular case, you can erupt even basalt. And you, we saw basalt at Mount Adams at the surface in the initial stages. But if you start building up the edifice, the basalt can't make it. And the larger the edifice, the taller it is, then the more evolved the magma must be to be able to reach the surface. A very simple diagram. And that accounts for what we see at Mount Adams. Primitive dense basalts are always erupted, but when they are in the edifice, they can't rise within the uh, uh, influence domain of the edifice. They have to go laterally, and then we'll, we'll discuss that later on. Edifice destruction, I've talked about this. If we, of course, destroy the edifice, then you go back to initial condition, and you can erupt uh, more primitive magmas. No problem there. And that diagram that I've shown you before accounts for this very nicely. You can add volatiles. It's going to change the picture. Mounted islands had about 5% water in solution. So that was the dry diagram, and that's the diagram with water. And you can see it displaces the curve here, of course, with water, magmas are uh, less dense. And of course, they are increasing less dense because as they rise, they nuclear gas bubbles. And I believe that Michael has talked about that. So that would be the hydrostatic uh, pressure. It's calculated on hydrostatic distribution in a column that has some gas. And you can see that this place is this boundary. But uh, again, we're still in the domain that we that is relevant to uh, the edifice that we see on Earth. If you have to draw this diagram on other planets, of course, you have to allow for changes in the gravity field. And therefore, the edifice side will be modified. And as you all know, maybe, the largest volcanic edifice on the, the solar system is on Mars. And that's an edifice that rises to about 24 kilometers. 24 kilometers, but 24 kilometers on a planet with gravity that is one third that of Earth. If you scale it to Earth, it's uh, something like eight kilometers thickness, and it's about as high as uh, the largest volcanoes that we see on Earth, which is uh, Hawaii. So you can see that uh, there are differences according to gravity. But uh, if we scale for gravity, then we can see the same type of behaviors and the same types of thicknesses. If we want to look at Mount Adams in this diagram, just to make sure that we are not completely off, the peripheral basalts are there. <coughs> So they were able to erupt when there was no edifice. But that edifice was built up. These basalts were not able to erupt through the center. And then we were able to have flank andesites. So the flanks, the magma is still able to rise, but they can't make it to the top. And the summit andesite is indeed able to make it. So these, uh, these are the true uh, densities that we can calculate from the lava composition. And you can see that they're consistent with this basic diagram. So if we can't erupt, what happens? OK, we've just shown that the basalts can make it to the surface when there's no edifice. When there's an edifice, they can't make it anymore. And we've uh, explained that. So what happens? Well, magma gets stored. But to get stored, uh, magma just can't just pile up at uh, one point in space. It has to spread. Otherwise, it can't occupy the volume. So we'll see what happens. Uh, how does storage proceed? Magma can't erupt, so it has to stay. So remember, we are now going to look at situations in which the magma is too dense to be able to erupt. And we're going to see what, what are the implications for that. If you look at this uh, diagram again, you can see that there's an, uh, for this particular case, magma may be able to reach that height. But the largest overpressure in the magma column is not here, which is 0. It's going to be over there. If it's over there, the largest overpressure, you can show, depending on what you assume for the strength of rock, that the rock will break. So instead of a conduit that extends vertically, if it extends up to these areas, then uh, in this particular area, you will have the largest overpressure. And then the largest 
stress that's applied to the walls, and the walls will break, and you will be able to inject the magma laterally. So you will propagate a laterally a dike at, at levels in which the overpressure is large. Um, yes? Does that go horizontally? Yes, almost. Yes, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll solve for that. They go horizontally, but also vertically. Dikes always extend in both directions because there's, magma is overpressured, so it extends in, in all directions at the same time. But there's going to be, uh, depending on the pressure distribution, it extends more rapidly in the horizontal direction than in the vertical direction, or vice versa. We'll see that. So the, we're going to look for the lateral propagation around this level. And remember that this level depends on the density contrast and also on the edifice. So in particular, I'd like you to remember that when you're away from the zone of influence of the edifice, then you don't have the, this uh, additional stress field to worry about. And the magma that's buoyant can make it to the surface. And this is why I think we have basalt erupting in distal vents, because once uh, the uh, factor that propagates laterally is away from the influence of the edifice. There's nothing that can stop this magma from rising again. So we're going to deal with lateral magma transport. For this calculation, I'm going to assume there's a density interface that makes the calculation more stable, and you can make this density interface go to a very the density difference between these two things uh, can be uh, as small as you want, but uh, it makes the calculus simpler. And so we have magma that has a density intermediate between the two, lower. Density, uh, higher density here than here because it's a stable uh, a stratification. And we'll see how the magma propagates away from the central zone. So this had been solved by John Lister some time ago. We, uh, what we've done with a student called Virginie Pinel, we added the effect of the edifice. So what we have is around this uh, interface, we have a dike which will propagate horizontally. Now the propagation front is going to be at some uh, distance from the vent, which is going to increase with time. We have a magma inside, and we're going to solve for the way the magma propagates. And what I would like you to notice is that we'll solve for the vertical extent of the fracture and the way it propagates horizontally as well. And in, we'll compare what happens with, with and without uh, an edifice. So. We can start by statics, because the, most of the flow is in the orbital direction. So we still are going to have a basically hydrostatic uh, pressure distribution within your fracture. So the fracture is open because it's overpressured. And so the pressure in your fracture is going to be the difference in pressure due to the uh, different density involved, plus uh, the stress field due to the edifice. And then if you want to look at the way the propagation works, you have to look at the horizontal gradient of that pressure, which is the, that's the driving force for your lateral magma flow. So you differentiate it with uh, respect to x, and that's what you get. And uh, that's differentially in x. And you can see there's these density differences that comes in, and of course the gradient in the uh, stress uh, field due to the edifice. Same thing above and below. Above and below, you have different densities, because here you have a density of the uh, upper medium and density of the lower medium. Uh, but that's basically just hydrostatics. So if you calculate over pressure, it's an elastic medium. You can figure out the crack width. That's simple elastic theory. Then to close the problem, you have to figure out what happens at the uh, surface edges. And uh, we use what is called the linear fracture mechanics. And uh, we specified that the, uh, I'll come back to that if you want to, you have to, you must, you need a boundary condition to uh, what happens at this edge. And we assume that there's no uh, toughness to the rock. The rocks are, have been weakened. And so we assume that. It's not a major factor here, but I'll, if you want, I will uh, we'll come back to that later on. But you need a, a closure condition for the, uh, the two ends here for the, this fracture. So then you go through the same kind of uh, Navier-Stokes equation. Uh, you solve for Navier-Stokes equation. You, you may recognize things that are very, are very similar to the equations that we had for lava flow. The same thing, which uh, then are going to be uh, used to derive the thickness of the fracture as a function of time and, and distance. If you, uh, we're going to use solutions for a constant uh, in rate of uh, 
like my input. Uh, you can do any uh, input rate that you want to, and uh, there are good reasons in nature for why the input rate should vary with time, but we're not going to go through that. And with that edifice, uh, John Lister was able to uh, give you uh, analytical solutions that show you that uh, the front propagates as time to the 8 over 11th power, and the thickness of your dike is proportional to t to the 1 11th power. You can see that uh, this, uh, the thickness of your fracture is not increasing rapidly with time. I'll, uh, in the handout I will give you, the handout will give you the references for all these uh, equations. So we're going to compare what happens. So the basic problem is don't worry about fracture, the ends of the fracture. The important thing is the fluid mechanics here. We're going to compare what happens without an edifice and with an edifice. The edifice is uh, over here, it's a small part. And we inject, so the radius of the edifice is, uh, you can see, uh, 1. Here there's no edifice, but we still scale the same uh, distance. It's in French, so that's lateral position, okay? Elastic pressure, profundized depth. And then we're going to see, we're gonna, and time is made dimensionless. That's a time scale that you, uh, that's related to the flow, and that depends on viscosity. So we start propagating, and now we've reached 1. So when there's no edifice, you can see that because, of course, uh, we're driving the flow laterally. There's always more pressure at the inlet than away. So the, the fracture extends vertically uh, more at the x equals 0 than at x equals 1. Yes, just a reflection of the lateral pressure difference. But you can see here that uh, we, uh, we had a small thickness here because we had the additional, it is exactly the same condition, but we had, we had the additional uh, stress field due to the edifice. So the fracture here was, uh, as, uh, could not extend to the same height as before. And at the same time, of course, we've, uh, because it's the same time, we've injected more magma. So the fracture is actually propagating a little bit faster. Instead of having one here, it's at two because we have the same volume. And the same volume uh, could not be fit into a, a tall fracture. So it had to be fit later. Now you can see, of course, that as you move away from uh, the edifice, the uh, pressure due to the edifice decreases, and hence the uh, fracture can grow taller. So this is the story of everything that's going to happen. You, you'll see that without an edifice, the fracture propagates. The tallest point is always at the axis when there's no edifice, because this is where the pressure is largest. When there's an edifice, you can see that this is not going to be true. You can see that the fracture will extend vertically. And uh, we're, going to, we're going to go through this. Now, I will draw two, these two arrows. The uh, yellow arrow is the dike tip. So that's where the, the end of the dike is. And you can see at this dimension of time of 1, again, that fracture has propagated to a larger distance because it's the same volume that's been injected. But the fissure could not be tall here. So it had to be uh, farther away. And uh, the white arrow is giving you the, the distance at which the dike is tallest. So. He, what I would like to notice is that for this particular case, this arrow will always be at the inlet, because that's always where the pressure is largest. But for this laterally propagating dike, this arrow is not going to be at the dike tip. It's going to be slightly remote from the dike tip, because of course the dike has, gone, has got to uh, thin to zero. So the tallest point is, is not at the front. So we're propagating. Now you can see there's going to be a difference between the tallest part of the dike and the dike tip, and they don't move at the same velocity. So if you monitor seism seismically what happens, you must be wary about uh, this. Of course, this thing is cracking the rock at all times. But what you have to follow is, of course, the, uh, the location of the uh, shallowest cracks. And this is, um, this is where the uh, eruption will occur eventually. And it's not going to be at the dike tip. OK, so you can see the same story. You can see why now the dike has developed. And basically, now you're away from the edifice. And away from the edifice, you can paste that. On top of that is uh, basically the solution without an edifice here. You're sufficiently far away so that there's no influence of the edifice. But you can see how the edifice is uh, determining the propagation. It's determining the propagation over a distance which is much larger than the uh, other radius. Right, so if we look at the uh, locations of the eruptive event, we can compare these two cases. So uh, we compare the uh, fracture profiles at different times, T 
is uh, the time scale, so one, two, three. And uh, with the dashed lines, there's no edifice, and uh, the full lines are with an edifice. And you can see the same story, is that the, uh, at the, uh, with an edifice, the dike propagates farther away, simply because the, you cannot open up large fractures beneath an edifice because of the uh, confining pressure that the edifice imposes. If there's no edifice, the crack will always extend, will always be tallest at the inlet. So you will have summit eruptions, but you won't have distal eruptions. With an edifice, you will have distal eruptions. But the dike will extend to distances that are larger than the site of the eruption. The dike is longer than the, uh, than the eruptive uh, fissure. And if you now change the uh, viscosity, the flux, etc. So that's the top of the dike, here the surface. I'm showing you uh, five curves. Now these curves, because there's dimensionless parameters, increasing the flux or increasing viscosity has exactly the same effect. You remember that uh, in the case of the lava flow, it was the same. The thickness of lava was, uh, the thickness of lava in the case of a flow thickness was So viscosity and the eruption rate are the same effect, and it's the same here. So if you have a small flux, small magma viscosity, you can travel extremely, uh, at large, extremely large distances away from uh, the axis. In fact, uh, you may not e even erupt. And uh, if you uh, go to larger fluxes or larger viscosities, then you may be able to erupt. And what I would like you to notice is that the larger the viscosity, the closer to the actual area you would be. So it's the same basic idea that you have to worry about magma properties and also the rate at which you're feeding your system. And they're not completely independent, of course, in nature, but if you want, if you go to any volcano that you want to see, you must treat them as independent because they might they are determined by other by independent factors. So these principles, I think, account for the additional erupted products at Mount Adams, which I've told you quite a lot about. Primitive magmas are denser than evolved ones, so once they're at the edifice, they cannot rise to the summit, and this is what we observe. They're less viscous than evolved ones. And so they can travel large distances away from the actual zone, and they're transported by radially propagating dikes. And that's, of course, consistent with uh, what we see in these volcanoes. I will show you se several observations that, that, are, that uh, allow us to check that this is not completely stable. It's, e it's hard to find out uh, fossil magma systems, because they're not uh, readily uh, available for inspection. So, there's a beautiful system called Summer Coon. It's in Colorado. And that's a Google Earth picture. And you can see this concentric feature. I will show you the geological map. That's uh, an ancient volcano. There's still remnants of uh, distal lava flows. And the distal lava flows allow you to, uh, to uh, figure out what, the, what, was that, what was there before. There was an edifice. The edifice rose to a, a height of about two kilometers at a radius of about seven kilometers. You find out simply by looking at the slopes of these uh, distal uh, lavas, a series of them, so you can reconstruct what was the, the edifice. Everything has been eroded away, but because you can see you're still close to the surface, you've basically scraped away the edifice, and you're down at the original ground surface before the edifice got built, which is a beautiful thing. And you can see these, there's some radial structures that you can guess from this uh, photographs, and these are radial dikes, and uh, that's the geological map, so it's more complicated, so don't be afraid by all these symbols if you're not petrologists. So that's the same thing, but now in geology. Uh, the color scheme tells you focus on these things, the flows and dikes. The, uh, the black things are primitive lavas, the basaltic andesites in this case. Many, uh, many continental volcanoes in this area are, are fed by uh, basaltic andesites. And then you go up the differential sequence to uh, day sites and rhyolites. 
So the blue is the most evolved magma, and the black is the less, least evolved magma. You can see that there's radial dikes everywhere from basalts, but uh, these radial dikes uh, stop short of the uh, actual area. As you go to uh, more evolved magmas, the more evolved magmas, you can see that they make it somewhat closer to the uh, axis. And you can see that the most evolved ones, they go right through. Okay. So this is consistent with what I've shown you, is that you, what happens is that as the edifice got built, there was still basalt being fed into the area, but the basalt could not erupt close to the surface, so they fed dikes. And these dikes uh, eventually ruptured the surface. There's a, a complicated story here. There's no, uh, these have not been dated carefully, but, uh, and then of course, as you get more and more evolved, you are still able to rise through the summit area. And that's quite the same story as we saw at Mount Adams. Sorry? These ones, because they are thicker and uh, uh, we don't know the age. Okay, so okay. there's a whole uh, story about the age. Okay. You can find, you see uh, here, there's some, uh, I've not shown the picture, there's a basaltic type that extends even farther away here. And there you can see oh, the thickness is, uh, is larger here, and that it's not something that's been invented. These dikes go slightly thinner as you go close to the axis. It's also concerned with the confining pressure. Okay, so we saw that uh, an edifice acts to generate uh, laterally propagating dikes, and that's also a temporary storage, but is it temporary? So now I'm going to, uh, to go a little bit berserk, and I'm going to uh, draw sweeping conclusions about the way magma system evolved. But I think there's, a, there's a, some story there. And that's a story I think that needs to be worked out in more detail. So one consequence of edifice growth is that you will, uh, the stress field confines dikes at increasingly larger depths. And you can see that you're pushing, therefore, your location of magma storage down. So uh, what could happen, and uh, that is something we, uh, we, can, uh, and, uh, we, we can discuss, and I'll discuss some observations. We start. Primitive magma is buoyant enough to reach the surface. We saw that at Mount Adams. We also saw that at Samokun. Now this primitive magma, of course, be, because it's erupting, it's able to build an edifice. But unfortunately, that's a self-defeating uh, mechanism. If it builds up a big edifice, then it generates a stress field that's not going to favor continued eruption. So eventually, that stops this magma from erupting, and it has to get stored somewhere. So yet if it prevents a central eruption, lateral magma flow can occur, and you might have some eruptions there, but you will tend to uh, store some magma there, and maybe form a, a magma reservoir. That magma reservoir, of course, is going to differentiate. Uh, depends on the story between uh, what's been erupted and what's been fed from below. And that is something that we, uh, we can maybe uh, uh, work out with models. And now, of course, uh, if I'm differentiating my primitive magma in that storage zone, I'm producing evolved magma that are buoyant. And these buoyant magma can erupt again centrally. But of course, these magma will contribute to growth of the edifice. And then again, it's not going to be good. But uh, the, if you still feed the primitive magma from depths, then of course, because now you've got a larger edifice due to the eruptions of these evolved magmas, your new uh, primitive magma storage zone is deeper now. Now, of course, if you keep feeding uh, primitive magma, they can't rise, and they will uh, eventually feed uh, distal uh, fissures and distal vents. And then, of course, you can uh, repeat that sequence and have an edifice growing, etc. That's right. You can play the game farther. But I think it's, it would be nice to see evidence for pressure variations in your reservoir. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So that's a story that's feasible. There are, of course, many complicating factors. But I think you can see there should be a link between the growth of the edifice and the way you store magma. Now, at Mount Sinanus, there was a beautiful data set uh, collected by Jim Gardner and others. So these are petrological pressure estimates for Mount Sinanus. So last eruption, 1980, is over here. And you can see this is something that extends as far back as 4,000 years. There's an interesting compositional variation. If, 
but I'm not going to describe. It's mostly day sites, basically. So there's slight variations, which are telling us something. But uh, And you can see that the pressure varies with time. So there's an experimental uncertainty. These pressure estimates are, are done very empirically. What you, you, what you start with is a given assemblage, and you let it crystallize and you work out what is the mineral assemblage, and you compare this with uh, what you see in erupted products. So the, uh, the uh, mineral assemblage, it was several mineral phases, and that will also account for variations in the uh, water contents. And so you match, basically, your mineral assemblages in your experimental charge with the observed ones, and then you can get pressure. You also get the water content. So this is what they observe. There's an uncertainty of about 0.5 kilobars, which is large. But you can see the variation is larger than the uncertainty. And what you have is pressure decrease and a large pressure increase, pressure decrease, and you have cycles. So pressure is varying in that system. Unfortunately, we don't know the story of uh, the, what happened in these old times. We, we have a record of what the edifice did. Here we knew there were landslides. There was an edifice, big landslides that decapitated the edifice. And you can see that after this landslide, the pressure was smaller. So the pressure of storage zone was smaller. And li quite likely, uh, the storage zone was at shallower depths. We know that the major phase of uh, stratocone growth at Mount St. Helens is between the, these eruption and that eruption. There was very little eruption going on uh, away from the summit. Uh, uh, but there was quite a lot of lava flows, etc., flows and domes, which uh, built the cone as we, uh, we had it uh, almost until the last eruption. And you can see, therefore, that between this stage and that stage, and the major start of goes, you increase pressure. So that is very hard to explain. These very large pressure differences, I think, is, uh, can be related to the, the buildup of this large uh, edifice. The next thing we know, here, in that particular case, we knew, again, there was a destruction of edifice there at the, between these two eruptions. These, these two eruptions are separated by a few uh, tens of years. We know that because uh, there's uh, almost no alteration between deposits. So if these had stayed for several decades, we would have seen uh, deposits. So this mark uh, pressure uh, release is associated with the destruction and a very fast pressure release which I think is consistent with the fact that you have a very fast uh, event, which is the destruction of the edifice. And then the story goes again. So you can see that uh, first is that we have uh, changes in the story system. So that's one thing we have to worry about. And some of these changes are clearly related to what happened to the edifice. And the last thing I'd like to see is the system of three sisters in Oregon. It's a beautiful uh, set of uh, volcanoes, three volcanoes in a row. Remarkable uh, system that's been heavily studied. All the lavas erupting through that system are cogenetic. And are beautiful. If you have never been there, you should. So that's south sister, middle sister, north sister. And there's a nice big lava flow here. And the three cones rise to about the same height. And that suggests, again, some control on the maximum height that the lava can reach. Why would it be? And there's an interesting story, so I'm not going to go to everything, but uh, just a major uh, fact about this. The basic uh, activity started at North Sister. There was a shield stage uh, before 200,000 years ago. But uh, when you start having the activity over these edifices, it started about uh, 180,000 years ago. And uh, you build up the cone. As you build up the cone later in the system, you have uh, basaltic andesites, flows, etc. The big strato cone got built uh, uh, to late in that uh, period. And eventually, you, s you stop the North Sister activity. The cone is too big. And what happens is that uh, South Sister becomes active. It's active until about 27 million years ago. Middle sister is at some activity at about the same time, but was most active between 25 and 18 years ago. So you can see there's a nice story of uh, activity in a cone that stops, and then the activity developed elsewhere. 
And you can see there's very little overlap between these uh, three different systems. Again, the larvas are all cogenetic. I think the story is, uh, you see there's a lot of radial dikes. And there's, in fact, a bi big radial dike that crosses all through uh, all these uh, edifices. It's quite logical to assume that the feeding system was beneath the original volcano, North Sister. And then eventually, eruptions were stopped from uh, uh, central uh, vents in the North Sister area. And the activity had to develop elsewhere. And you can see that as you go on the edifice, you stop the activity. And uh, the activity has to develop elsewhere. And North Sister eventually became active again at 19 million years ago. Again, no, when it started to become active, middle sister just stopped. And it evolved a very rapid lavas, almost rhyolite. And the other volcano stopped. So I think there's a very nice story here about the relationship between the edifice growth and uh, the fact that uh, you have to erupt elsewhere. And then uh, through all that time, North sister was cooking and eventually generated very evolved lavas that started to be uh, able to erupt again. And that's it.